So I want to introduce uh, the next two panelists. Uh, the first standing there at the podium is Will Jardie. Will is, a, is an artificial intelligence graduate researcher at Montana State University. We had to get somebody from Montana State University because at the University of Montana, we have only real intelligence. Um, Dan, yeah, you get that? Do I need to explain that to you? Yeah, okay. Uh, and then on Zoom, we have Miguel Romero, who is the uh, Director of Property and Casualty Regulatory Services for the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. So welcome, Will. Welcome, Miguel. Walk on. Am I going first then? Is that the plan? Uh, I think, so yeah. I'm waiting for Miguel to oh. say that he's on. He's on, but are you, are you Nope. There he is. There he is. Rock on. And I assume I'm coming through the, the mic and everything? All good? Yeah. yeah. Rock on. Um, so yeah, as, as I said, I'm from MSU. Uh, I'm with the Numerical Information Systems Laboratory there. I think uh, Dr. John Shepard, my advisor, came last year. And I'm calling, follow, following that up this year. Uh, given some of the recent work that we've been doing, specifically with the Smart Fires grant, which is a really cool grant, uh, it has pretty extensive uh, connections all, all over Montana. Uh, so I'm going to be introducing some of that. Uh, and funny enough, you say Montana State University is the only place with intelligence, even though I'm trying to build artificial intelligence, you know. <laughs> a little bit of contradiction there, I guess. But um, let, let's get into kind of what I'm, what I'm covering. Um, so this is the, the Smart Fire structure. This is kind of the main infographic we have for that grant. This is a NSF uh, EPSCoR grant. NSF obviously is the National uh, Science Foundation for the US. That's where a lot of the funding for schools comes through. And EPSCoR is a uh, specific collection of uh, funding that they have set aside for smaller schools in smaller states. Because you know, if it went just to the people with creditations who seem to be co doing cool work, California and Florida and all of them are taking all the work, right? Um, so we have the EPSCoR, which purposely takes money and gives it to come some, some of the smaller schools. Um, and we have the Smart Fires, which is a five-year long grant. I think it's $20 million or so with a couple other uh, incoming uh, flows of money. And it has four main thrusts uh, that we're looking at. Um, let me take a step back and first say that Smart Fires uh, has you know the fun thing that we do where we try to make a uh, everything in acronym that, that sounds cool. And so the capitalization is a little weird here. Sensors, machine learning, and artificial intelligence, and real-time fire science. Um, and so it's this idea of trying to blend together not just um, you know uh, our own hard science, our own natural sciences, but also trying to bring in artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, some of this more diversity of modern models. Um, and there's four different thrusts that go on there. Uh, you can see them up there. I, I like to think about it, there's three, and then there's AI ML who encapsulates all three of them uh, and really tries to execute them effectively. Um, so the first part we have is the fire and smoke science, where we're trying to better understand fire and smoke. Um, we're trying to do the natural science approach, we're trying to collect data, make mathematical models, we're trying to understand how fire spreads, and uh, more importantly, kind of a, a larger uh, spotlight is being shown on smoke and how it affects health and how smoke spreads. Because we have a good idea about how fire spreads. Give me the fire pack, give me the temperature, give me the airflow and the elevation. I can give you a good prediction on how fire spreads, how fast it will, but we have you know, a, a pretty limited knowledge on how smoke itself spreads. When we talk, start talking about air quality index, we can't necessarily project forward, when I do this burn, this is how it's gonna affect what people are breathing in. Uh, but we can measure real time, right? And so we wanna make that gap between predicting what type of smoke and what type of particles are gonna be in the air, given you know, I'm burning here and what's the city you know, 50 miles away going to experience. That's where a lot of the, the natural science is coming in right now. Uh, the next part is the smart optical sensors. And this is trying to take modern technology, modern uh, sensors, which we call hyperspectral sensors, and the main ones we're looking at. Uh, if you think about regular picture cameras, we have red, green, and blue. 
Well, if you know anything about basic science and how light, light works, it's not just red, green, and blue. We have uh, a continuous spectrum, an infinite number of lights and wavelengths that are happening in there, right? So what if we can capture all of that information and somehow use that to better understand what's happening when a fire happens, right? Uh, this is akin to uh, spectroscopy, which we do in the lab all the time, and lets you use shining a light at materials to understand what's in that material and the kind of the characteristics of it. So the hope is that we can take these really advanced cameras, throw them on drones, fly the drones over active fire or before a fire starts, and get an idea of what's being put up into the air. What exactly is you know, the makeup of this smoke? And then we can understand how the smoke and characteristics of the smoke evolve over time. So you can quickly see how understanding and doing smart optical sensors quickly feeds into the fire and smoke science portion where we're understanding how fire is igniting and we're understanding what the smoke has in it, right? Um, and then the next portion kind of takes a step back a little bit from the actual uh, hard natural sciences and goes to more of the soft sciences or uh, sociology and, and those kind of people-related sciences, right? And so we're trying to uh, take one of the main thrusts is uh, reaching out to local communities and bridge, bridging this uh, natural sciences into their uh, actual communities, how they perceive what's happening, how they understand what's happening, um, and their, their perception of it, right? And so we're trying to measure and understand uh, how people agree or disagree with the steps we're taking. We're trying to understand how their mental healths are being affected with a lot of what we call mega fires, these fires that aren't just smaller uh, you know, contained ones, but ones that get out of hand or burn massive amount of, amount of land, affect a lot of communities, we see a lot of mental health effects from that. How do we measure that? How do we predict that? How do we take that side of the social science, a somewhat measurable uh, idea, and integrate it into this decision making? And definitely if we're doing quantifiable models, uh, models that actually use inputs, right? What's the amount that's gonna be burned? What's the chances that it burns down a house? And we're trying to also bring in this mental health and the health communities, uh, along with the health from, uh, let's say the smoke comes over and what's the health for you know, the community as, as a whole, and how does that affect, say, asthma and uh, different types of cancer, right? So where do I come into this, right? Because I'm in the AI ML approach, and those three are very much uh, well-motivated steps forward, but AI ML is more of a technique for solving problems, right? You take a model, make it intelligent, learn something, and then try to solve a problem. So for each of these thrusts, I put down a couple of spots where we're working actively with people, right? In the case of fire and smoke science, we're working with simulations. We're simulating how something, uh, how, you know, the uh, smoke spreads or the fire burns. Um, and we're trying to use these intelligent systems instead of having to do everything by hand to almost learn that step forward, right? If I have a whole ton of actual real world data, can I learn how that data or how that fire spreads and then use that to simulate forward learning the parameters? Um, and data mining where you just have a crap ton of information or uh, a lot of, lot of data sets that aren't necessarily structured and you extract out a whole ton of information. Um, Next, we have the, the smart optical sensors people. The issues with the hyperspectral cam cameras, right, is that there's a, a lot of information, right? We're collecting thousands of different types of color, right, and the amount of color there is. We can't save all of that on a tiny drone, and so we have to actively select what colors we're saving, and we have a couple of models that help us adapt and choose which colors we're going to select and keep, right? Uh, and hopefully, instead of just providing a static data set, we actually have one that properly ref reflects what's happening in the fire and the smoke. Uh, we can use that to better understand and model uh, the situation along with the data processing. Once we have the data at home, how do we actually process that and how do we do that uh, in an intelligent way, kind of leveraging some of these new models. Uh, and then finally, we have the social side of things, which is where I'm mostly plugged into, and this is with uh, primarily decision support systems, or one of the key things we're looking at there, and how do we create a system that supports uh, 
forest managers in making decisions. And we want to bring in not just what a lot of them do now, which is the technical side of things. What is the fuel makeup? What is the um, chances that things burn? What is the weather looking like? What are the chances that a fire gets ignited? But then we're also taking the, we want to take the step forward and bring in how are people going to respond to this? How is this going to affect the health, both mental and physical? Um, and then we can you know, provide that to not just forest managers, but also you know, insurance individuals and uh, those who make policies. And we can say, OK, if you make the decision to burn here, your numbers are going to go up. Or uh, you're more likely to protect people and get more people on board. right? There's also a whole theory called decision theory, right? which is how do we make decisions intelligently. And a lot of the current way we use DSSs, decision support systems, doesn't use that, that rigorous theory that we have, how people cognitively think and understand steps forward. We're trying to bridge that gap and bring it into there, along with sentiment analysis, where we're able to automatically pull out how do people generally feel about a certain you know, movement or at a certain time, right? So we can scrape through Twitter and see, OK, are people generally happy right now or generally uh, angry? And that allows us to have a quick response on how are people responding to, say, a new wildfire uh, gets ignited over in the Missoula area. How are people responding and talking about it? And we don't have to manually go through. A system will tell us, OK, this is the general uh, A, B, and C that seems to be going on there. Um, so yeah, that's the main of the, the Smart Fires project and what we're trying to, to accomplish there. We have those four main thrusts. And uh, as I've said, I'm working on the decision support system side of it, where I'm trying to help build some of these. Uh, and there's two main components to building a successful decision support system. Uh, specifically, we're talking about personal decision support systems here, where you have a human in the loop, right? Um, this is a common idea that's required in kind of ethical AI is that it's not just a standalone system with no human interaction because that can go off the rails very quickly. You want a human in the loop to kind of auto-correct and kind of bring us back on track or to make those really crucial decisions when things need to be, need to be decided, right? Um, because, and we had a whole discussion about this with my lab, um, LLMs, these large language models along with a lot of these expert systems, don't do what we call uh, understanding, right? They don't properly uh, bring in this information, process it in a way that is grounded in the real world. It misses this grounding problem where we don't understand uh, what a ball is without actually being able to hold a ball and play with a ball and interact with a ball. So if you talk about these models, they aren't grounded in what the real world is. They just kind of guess with these probabilities. They see balls seem to uh, be attached to sports. And so they, they make that connection, but they don't understand what those concepts are at an intuitive level. And so you have the first step, where it's computer systems. This processes all the data. This runs all the math. This does all the kind of hard, heavy lifting when it comes to the data side of things and the simulation side of things. Um, and then you have the second step, which is required, which is the human decision makers, right? These are the humans in the loop, the forest managers. These are the people actually responsible and taking the responsibility for the decisions being made. Uh, because at the end of the day, if a computer made the decisions, yeah, you can point at the computer and say it's your fault, but that doesn't help us moving forward, right? We can build better computers, or we can have a human in the loop who really uh, can take responsibility and understand what's, what's going on, right? Um, there's a couple of groups that do kind of full front-to-end versions of this decision support. They still require you to be uh, in the process, right? Uh, but they try to disseminate knowledge. They try to require or give as much information as possible to you while you're making that decision. Um, and so the first one is uh, Forces. This is for uh, US, and it uh, uses kind of a front-end approach, and it does a lot of heuristic choices. Um, so they don't use necessarily any real technical advanced ML or anything like that. They just make simple decisions that if A, then B, uh, and they hard code that in. The next one is the Wildland uh, Fire DSS. This is produced um, by the US Forest, uh, oh, US Forest something or other. Uh, I can't remember what, what the last, last term is there. Um, but it's used by the US Forest Managers for long-term implementation plans. And this is what I'm going to talk about in a minute with probabilistic risk assessment, um, is that we're often missing this portion that is long-term. 
we do what's called just you know one and done type management where we look at the current state of the of the system maybe of the year right and we take one step forward and then we stop and that's as far forward as we look and then the next time we have to make a decision we analyze it and then take one step forward we don't consider all of those decisions intertwined and we don't consider that the decision I make now is going to affect 15 decisions down the road. And so this idea of a long-term implementation plan tries to break that and tries to have what we call adaptive decision management, where you uh, adapt to what's happening and you have a plan to adapt going forward. Um, and then the last one that I have up there is Triads. This is over in Europe, um, where they're trying to kind of do the same thing that this Wildland Fire DSS and Forsyth are doing, but instead of being primarily located in the US and a little bit in Canada, it's located in Europe and takes into account the different type of ecology that goes on there. Um, so, so, can I ask a question? Yeah, fire away. Yeah, so that, that implementation one is actually one of, the, one of the biggest difficulties and the reason that Forsyth and Wildfire DSS have had so much success um, is because the whole purpose of them is trying to bridge that gap, right? People come to uh, these well-accepted, well-funded US uh, government agencies, right, and say, okay, what do I do next, right? And then they have experts there that will help direct you forward, right? Um, and so if, people are willing to take the step back and come to these groups, um, it's pretty simple to integrate in. And they seem to have pretty good success with getting them implemented. The difficulty comes when people decide not to go with these scaffolded groups or maybe don't have access to them. Um, if you go to the Wild, uh, Wild Land Fire DSS, there's a whole um, government website for it. Everything is on there. It's phenomenal, except you have to have access to it and you have to have uh, a, a sign in for it. And so myself as a researcher, cool, I wanna go check out what they have and I wanna go look at this uh, Land Fire and Behave Plus, which they're two fundamental models. Um, however, everything is behind having an institutional login for that and since I haven't worked with them before, I can't use it. And so what happens is that if you don't have connections to Forsyth, Wildland, uh, Wildland Fire DSS, you don't have access to it at all. So you have to go implement it yourself. And there have been a couple of papers that um, will go out and survey you know, wildfire managers, and what they've found is that either someone in the group has extensive experience with this, and it can be implemented really quick, right? Or someone doesn't, and it doesn't get implemented at all. We don't use these personal decision uh, support systems, right? And so it all depends on someone having tech savvy uh, experience or connections to one of these groups. And if they don't, then it just doesn't get implemented uh, at all, and people just do an ad hoc version of it, saying, oh, it's good enough, right? Uh, I understand the system, so I'm gonna make a uh, unfounded statement that the short-term benefits uh, are better than long-term benefits and rely on their own experience. Um, yeah, so it's very much, they either have access to these systems, in which case they are widely accepted, or no one in the system, or no, no one in the group understands the systems and just nothing happens at all. Um, does that kind of answer, answer the question? I'm going to assume it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it's the, it's the comfort with it, right? Um, people tend not to be too scared of, of implementing AI once they know it, but if they don't know it, they don't touch it. Um, okay, so let's go forward and kind of bring in another, another term, and this is my current work is trying to bring in uh, these ideas in this other domain called probabilistic risk assessment, specifically a version of it used by NASA and in nuclear management, that's both in uh, kind of nuclear weapons management and also nuclear power plant management, um, where you have this very rigid systematic structure that's very well defined and has lots of fail-safes, right? Because when you send someone into space, 
you need to make sure that they can, they can come home safe. Or when you're working with nuclear, you have to make sure it doesn't go awry, right? Why don't we try to bring in that same type of expectation into wildfire management? There's two different ideas that you require, and these kind of link back and forth. Um, you have this idea of risk-informed decision-making and continuous risk management. Um, risk-informed decision-making uses this idea of quantified risk, an actual number attached to what's the risk of doing an event, um, and this idea of continuous risk management where you continuously take steps and you're going to cycle between RIDM and CRM. Um, for anyone who's trying to kind of step into this space in the wildfire management, the closest two ideas you have are risk-informed decision support systems and adaptive forest, uh, forest management. And these kind of two ideas uh, have a shadow of what risk-informed decision-making and CRM are, but they kind of fall short in some of the key aspects. Um, here's our couple of graphics, which I don't expect that you can read these at all, um, <laughs> from the NASA uh, documentation that, that outlays what all the expectations for each mission are, but the main thing to look at is the risk management, or probabilistic risk management, is a cycle between RIDM and CRM. And so you're going to stick in this kind of cycle for the commutative document, um, and then when you hit a point where you need to make a decision, you jump over to this RIDM structure. And this R, uh, RIDM, I'm gonna jump over that, um, has a couple of very, very key features. The first is this graded analysis. If I don't feel confident in my current uh, decision or my current alternatives that I could look at, I'm going to do a, you know, a, a collection of investigations, kind of an investigation step, and then stop, do I have enough confidence to make a decision? If I don't, I'm gonna do more research. Do I have enough confidence now? You're gonna keep doing that until you get to the end when you make your decision, right? Um, there's also this idea of commitment, which the, um, is the amount of risk you're willing to take on for the benefit you're looking for. Um, and this keeps you true to the step that you're deciding to make, um, because if you're, you know, uh, you can easily give yourself a strong bias in comfortableness if you don't set a hard boundary on this is the commitment we want, right? And that at least is a heuristic to start with. Um, and the last is that is probabilistic and continuous, which are two very difficult uh, mountains to uh, get on top of for wildfire management because it is such a interdisciplinary difficult field. Um, and so ultimately what we're trying to do, and I did a whole lit review on looking for papers that did PRA that specific cycle and DSS, um, and the main takeaways, and I'll hit a couple of these, is that if there was a probabilistic component to the whole analysis, um, it was not provided in an effective way to the user. Right? It was either flattened down into just, uh, we've probably have seen the, the number rating, which is based on the Cana uh, Canada, the Canadian uh, risk management uh, system, right? Where it's you know, one through five. What is the risk of a fire happening in, in a certain day, right? It's either flattened down to that, where we lose all that probability, or far too much information is provided where we can't necessarily do a graded approach and we're just bombarded with too much information right off the bat and we don't have kind of this graded understanding of what's going on. Um, the last one is that um, a lot of times these simulations are either too complicated and so we don't break, bake in uncertainty into them. And so at, at the end of the simulation it says, this is what's going to happen, this is reality, or um, they try to run these models over and over and over and over again with a little bit of randomness in there, and then we'll just use it at the end to say, here's the probability, right? Um, we're working on a model uh, which is continuous time Bayesian networks, and we're adding a spatial component to it that have in the actual simulation going forward this baked in probability. And so um, at the end, when you get the results of, you know, here's the chance that a fire happens here, what's the speed that it spread forward, that probability is a fundamental characteristic and will actually uh, be mathematically founded, uh, founded in something, right? And we can easily bring in these experts to make what we call Bayesian network models, which kind of say, here are all, how all of the features in a specific location relate to each other. How does elevation affect fire spread, affect uh, upward draft versus downward draft, which affects temperature? How do all of these relate in a very small itemi or atomized location, and then we can create this cool CTBN structure that compiles all this information together and does a continuous projection forward, giving you probabilities. 
Um, that's the main work that we're doing. Um, the smart fires, if you're interested in that, um, just you know, go into Google smart dash fire um, and it should pop up a Montana NSF EPSCOR project. On there it has all the stuff of our strategic plan, um, the different uh, citations, different papers we've released so far, uh, and some of the broader impacts. There's a lot of outreach stuff that we are doing. Um, yeah. And then I'll pass it over to you, uh, Miguel, um, unless you have a question or two uh, before hitting yeah. your stuff. Yeah. I, I have a question for you, if you have a second. Yep. So um, it, it, it couples like back, you were talking about your literature review, and then you talked about some of the models that you are using. Has generative, generative AI changed the discussion at all? It sounds like maybe not, but I guess I am curious if, if that's at all playing into the space that you're in right now, given how national that Mm -hmm. So there's two different ways that you can you can kind of address that answer. The first one is on a personal level, and the other one's kind of on a model level. Uh, on the model level, I I went and like looked for this because it is it's a big topic right now, right? So you expect people to be using these LLMs um, in their in their models, and I was only able to hunt down one, um, and it doesn't have any citations and hasn't gained any traction, um, and. Honestly, for, for a good reason, because it's, it's taking all of this statistically viable information and flattening it down into just one simple statement, right? And so you lose this graded approach, you lose this probability, you lose understanding and the human aspect. Um, the other direction, and this is where it's, it's more interesting, is people will use it all the time when they're trying to understand a system and to kind of help fill in their personal gaps. And so similar to how you can have 50 different simulation models and 50 different graphs that tell you information that leads you to making a decision, right? You can make a similar thing where you query, uh, you query, you know, ChatGPT or, uh, or Sonnet or any of these large language models and ask them, what does the literature say on A? What does the literature conclude about B? What is the synopsis of our understanding on X, right? Um, and then they take that forward and, and that's seen great success, right? Where people use LLMs to more understand the uh, whole environment opposed to building a system off it. Um, yeah, do we want to hit questions right now or towards the end? Save them for the, for the very end, yeah. So take all those questions, put them in your back pocket, um, and then we'll let uh, Miguel go through and then, and then hit questions. Right, uh, so thank you everyone for allowing me to present and join you virtually. Uh, apologize if I have audio issues. I, it, I was a uh, little cutting out, a little bit in and out, but I'll try to muster through those. Uh, so like I said earlier, my name is Miguel Romero, I'm director for PNC Regulatory Services at the NAC. Um, and really my areas of responsibility include uh, supporting the regulators anytime they're talking about cybersecurity, innovation, or technology. So today, uh, I'm more narrowly focused on updating you on the regulator work on AI. So I'll, I'll walk us through a couple of the initiatives and projects that we have ongoing, and I'm happy to take any questions if there are any for particularly as we go through this. So the first of these that I'll walk you through is, is the, our survey initiative. Um, our regulators operate on this perspective that uh, bad policy comes from bad data. And so really inform any of the policy discussions, they really try to take the time to engage with the public, engage with industry representatives to understand uh, how uh, specific, specific spaces operate. So in this case, AIP is a big discussion being had our regulators have been trying to survey the insurance industry to see how they are using AI or ML. So we did, we undertook a PNC, uh, a set of PNC surveys in 2022 and 2023. We followed that up with the life insurance survey and we're in the process of preparing and, and piloting a health insurance uh, AI ML survey, which will be issued in 2024. And then we anticipate having a report available to uh, the public by March of 2025. What I have on here is uh, some of the, the charge, which in our language really just refers to the assignments that the committee and, and the regulators have. So in this case, we're talking about the, having the assignment of understanding the use of AI and ML in the insurance industry. And the goal is to understand what the insurance industry is doing, 
um, and then get that information to help them to help the regulators develop their guidance, to inform the development of our regulatory framework, uh, to, and really just to inform the regulators generally. But they want to understand the value, the challenges, the promise of AI, kind of all uh, sides sides of that conversation. So uh, I mentioned three of the surveys have been completed, and I'll give you some high-level insights about them. Um, for the auto survey, 193 uh, auto insurers responded, expressing that 88% of them are using or are planning to use. That drops down to 70% for home and 58% for life. And you can see some of the uh, the number of respondents for each of them. And one one item that we did kind of call out is that there's a specific type of model or technique uh, that was included in the first two. It was or it was excluded from the first two, it was included in the last survey, some of that being just by, given how popular it is, and also how comfortable with that model regulators are, right? So regulators in the PNC space have been seeing what we refer to as GLMs for years now, so they didn't really feel like it was valuable to gain insights on how GLMs are being used in the PNC space, but for the life space, it's a relatively less frequently used or kind of emerging trend to see that, so they did want to get that data. But what you see is that it's, it's being used more often in PNC, less often in life. And really, I think that's reflective of the life insurance carriers generally operating more conservatively. Um, life products have a much longer tail to them. So if you misprice a product that has much bigger implications than say if you misprice an auto policy, you can adjust that rate next year and so on and so forth. So um, that to me goes a little bit consistent with like the extent of that difference um, was nonetheless surprising to our regulators, but again, it's important to understand how AI is being used. Um, I will note that all of this was prior to the advent of generative AI, and so I would anticipate that these numbers would only have increased, and, and then compounding that, these are two and three year old surveys, so it's just, you know, we take our time to, to gather this information thoughtfully, but even then, you know, information quickly becomes less useful, and so if anything, we would expect that the uptake in this would have increased since the survey time. So of those that responded that they are not using AI, we saw a pretty common thread, uh, no compelling business reason, lack of resources and expertise, reliance on legacy systems, waiting on regulators, kind of a mix of, of responses across the board. I, I think not necessarily baked into that, but it, it, our interpretation is, is that point about just the conservatism of the business and, and in the way that uh, third-party service providers are playing in this space. We, we think that they, they came into the auto space first and then and then kind of followed through the rest of the lines of business. Part of that being the PNC line of business is a larger line of business, so there's a little bit more room to operate in that space. And, you know, in our data we gather a lot of uh, qualitative um, reactions as well, and so I, I won't go through all of this, but we are seeing that the use of AI, although it's exploratory, is really kind of far reaching. We're seeing it across the board in marketing, underwriting, pricing, claims, fraud detection. For life, it was a little narrower, um, but still, nonetheless, several different uh, use cases are being explored. And we have heard that there is some promise in the uh, immediate results that carriers have experienced. So we think that AI may have the ability to, to bring forth efficiencies, improve the user experience, potentially lead to the innovation in the space leading to new products. Um, and so we see a lot of exploration across the board. And, and maybe a lot of this is more kind of the back end of an insurer's operation, but we think, we think if nothing else, even in the product development, AI is being considered there too. So digging a little bit deeper, uh, for home and auto, what we're showing here is, is we ask the question about not just are you using AI, but how are you using AI? So we, we distinguish between a couple of different um, extents of that question. So automate, are you using it to augment, or are you using it to support? And, and hopefully those terms are intuitive enough that you can kind of understand it in this context. But really the question is that to what extent is this replacing the use of humans in, in the loop? We do find that the regulators have taken a position that it is important to keep humans in the loop. Um, they re our regulators recognize that the AI has a lot of promise, but they do want to make sure that people understand um, it's still just a tool to be used properly. We need to have people involved. And certainly that varies based on the way that AI is being used. 
and we see that reflected in, in the responses that we received, right? So for marketing, um, we see it generally augmenting, but we did see a lot of automation in some cases. Uh, pricing and underwriting, maybe a little bit more automation, perhaps a little surprising, still some augmentation and supporting. Um, the, the nuance here is that as you dig deeper, what you find is like often automate really just means maybe the aggregation of information is being automated, but the key decisions are still being made with humans in the loop. And in a similar kind of pattern along with some uniqueness um, on the auto side. So a lot of a lot of use uh, kind of across the spectrum in, in marketing and pricing and variety. And then similarly that continues for uh, the life insurance side of the discussion. And so uh, you see some breakdown in it being used to augment uh, a lot of automation of pricing and underwriting and, and a lot of automation for risk management. Again, I think if you if you look down into the insurance uh, business across the board, what you'll see is that um, it, it, there are many steps in the life cycle, and so there are plenty of opportunities to automate or find more efficiency in a way that don't materially increase policyholder risk. That's the opinion pers and perspective we've heard from a lot of carriers, a lot of tech companies. Generally, our regulators get that uh, with a caveat on them. Ultimately, the carrier still makes retains the responsibility to ensure they're acting properly. I will note, we did see a huge uptake, obviously, in the automation on risk management, but only seven companies reported that they were using AI for risk management. So across the board, it's important to understand kind of the context of each of these data points. So if, if you dug down a little bit further, you'd see that of the people that are using it for risk management, automation tends to be a, a key path, but there are less people that are using it for, for risk management anyways. So, there's a lot of information that I'm tossing out of you here. What you're going to see is that third parties played a big role in the development and the use of AI, right? And so you can kind of see how that varies from auto to home to life. But across the board, the number that I think if you aggregate this enough, you'll find that it's about plus or minus 50% of the data and the models that are being supplied, uh, that are being used by the insurance industry are being supplied by third parties. And really, if you go case by case basis, depending on the way that you're using AI, sometimes it just it, it's just a little bit more challenging to integrate a third party. And in other cases, it's it's actually more logical to integrate a third party into your operations. All depending on the sources of data and the types of models that you're using, the risk and, and kind of the value proposition. But across the board, the key finding was that that 50% threshold that that third parties are playing a massive role. Um, and, and that kind of makes sense, a lot of this coming from tech companies or tech folk or insurance companies as well. Um, data is a big part of this discussion. You know, we spend a lot of time talking about our models, but data is another part of this. Um, the AI really enables us to intake and analyze than I think our carriers were able to do, uh, use before. And so what we see come through is just a wide range of data elements. <clears throat> So uh, a lot of consumer, so just topically, a lot, a lot of uh, uh, demographic information, consumer or other uh, related scores, occupation, education, financial, and so on and so forth, right? So it, it, hopefully the categories of data that's being used make sense based on the activity that you see. You do see some variation in there, so for claims, maybe medical data becomes a little bit more important than it does for marketing. For fraud detection, the vehicle data becomes a little bit more important than other elements, and so lots of, Lots of different inputs, but what you see is, is this is really changing and magnifying the importance of data. Certainly data has been important for a long period of time, uh, but I think if anything it's gotten more important, particularly with um, the advent of AI. So the health insurance survey, I mentioned that one was in process, and so here's the process that the regulators have followed. We have started with uh, meeting with consumer representatives to just receive general feedback on this initiative and on the initial survey questions. We finalized the list of survey questions, established the pilot, our meeting with a handful of companies, I think it's like six or seven health insurance carriers. We're going through the process of getting pilot study feedback and then setting up meetings with the carrier to, just to talk through and say what was clear and what was unclear in the questions that we're asking you. And then we're going to update that, uh, that uh, the survey based on the feedback we received. We will finalize all the experts and we will launch the survey in October. The timeline is that we hope to receive responses by October, no, November, um, by, sorry, January 15th, uh, and then 
it, by March, we hope to be able to re report to the public on what we found by that. So um, this is generally the, the process we're gonna follow. It's actually live and available if you're curious to see what the survey looks like. It's available online. If instead you wanna look at some of the, the detail in the, the, the past survey findings, you can reach out to myself and, um, and I can get you a link along that. It's publicly available. We publish summary memos with anonymized information on what our regulators found. And a lot of people have found that useful. Um, it, you know, it's, it's not for the faint of heart, it's very data heavy analysis, but if you want to dig back into how AI is being used by the lines of business, or even some of the third party service providers that we've seen play in the space, we did uh, publish a fair amount of our data um, on our website. So uh, reach back out to myself and I can help you with that information. So uh, the surveys, in the process we have been, uh, you know, we talked about the health insurance survey. Health insurance from product line to product line, it just varies so much. And so what our regulators did was they, they tentatively split this up into a two survey initiatives. The first of which would focus in on comprehensive insurance, major medical, small employer, major medical, comprehensive other individual and group student health plans. So we developed questions specific to that future we anticipate uh, asking questions maybe more specific to some of the other government-run healthcare programs. Um, and then in response to the feedback we've done, we've clarified a lot of our questions related to data use, the involvement of third parties, AI governance and operational functions. We're working with this software provider called Qualtrics um, to make sure that the survey experience is a seamless one. And so if you answer yes or no to some, that may exclude some of the questions that come in afterwards. Again, a lot of this is really hoping that uh, as our regulators later shift to having more policy discussions on what they should be doing to regulate the use of AI, they want to make sure they understand how companies are using it to start. Um, the surveys are one part of our story. They're not the whole of our story. Uh, our story really begins uh, or, or has a most recent milestone or earlier milestone in 2020 related to the adoption of principles on artificial intelligence. Um, our regulators seeing kind of the rapid rise in the use of AI even before uh, generative AI of late. Uh, wanted to make sure to express to the insurance industry how they felt about the use of AI. And so what they did was they adopted this set of principles to guide insurers in the use of AI. None of this isn't binding, this isn't a requirement, but the, this is a signal to the industry on what regulators expect. Um, and it gets more detailed than this, but at a high level, just expressing that they expect that the use of AI will be fair and ethical, that it will be accountable, um, that it will comply with state laws and regulations, it will be transparent um, and safe, secure, and, and developed in a robust uh, system. I, I, I expect that, uh, as, as a lot of us live, live our lives, we, we try to operate by many of these ideals, and I think industry generally received this well. Um, but however, it was just it was recognized this is this is an encouraged set of practices. Um, a lot of this was built on understanding how AI was being used even back in 2020. We did review a lot of uh, federal and, and independent literature to understand um, the, uh, what, what the prevailing best practices were. And so some of these principles draw heavily on, for instance, there's this NIST framework, National Institute of Standards and Technology developed this framework expressing their view of what responsible use of AI looks like. We leveraged a lot of that, but we also did a lot of listening to the insurance industry. Building on that, the regulators recently, in 2023, uh, adopted a model bulletin. So the model bulletin explains the way that um, uh, the regulators as a community viewed existing state law to apply. That bulletin has been adopted by 17 states, so it was adopted once at the NAIC level, but for it to really have any effect, it really needs to be adopted by states themselves, right? So we adopted it as a model, and then states have taken that, tailored it for their own authority and their own views, and then 17 have adopted it in their own state. It's a principles-based uh, bulletin that establishes guidelines and expectations uh, related, again, to that same topic of responsible use of AI. It, it's building on the principles, but it gets more granular. Um, it does remind insurers that the use of AI may, must comply with insurance laws and regulations, in particular, unfair practices. It does set the State Department expectations that, that how 
insurers will govern the use of AI. So it's, it's, it's not requiring, but it is saying, here's what our regulators expect. And, and lastly, it does say, we aren't doing exams yet, at least not to my knowledge, but it does express, here's the documentation we expect to be available when we come on site to look at your books and records. And so it has a pretty exhaustive list. And basically just saying, look, the examination standards that apply before, we believe apply here. And we believe we can look for these pieces of documentation, including the work that's performed by third parties, including really all aspects of your due diligence, how you decide that a model is worth it to use, what your governance, model governance looks like, et cetera. This is, for any company that's been subject to an exam, this is not dissimilar from what a lot of what they've experienced, except it's in the context of AI, right? Our companies have been providing information for years and years on how they govern or how they manage their risk or how they set up corporate governance practices or how they administer claims or how they go about deciding on their underwriting. They've been doing that for years. All of this just says that those examinations will happen in the context of AI as well. And we're now in the process of figuring out, well, how do we actually do an exam in the context of AI? What questions do we have to ask differently? And I'll cover that a little bit more in depth here in a second. What's in the bulletin? The bulletin's fairly straightforward. It's nine, 10, 11 pages, something like that. It has four sections. Introduction, background, and legislative authority. It just says, here is where we get the authority to do this. A lot of that rests on unfair trade practices act, but also the examination authority that each state has. Then it provides some key definitions. Those were generally written from a technical perspective, not a legal perspective. That was a big point of debate, but I think ultimately the regulator said, because we're not creating or defining state law, maybe the best thing is to explain how we view some of these concepts. Then the meat of the bulletin is regulatory guidance and expectations. It provides some general AI systems program guidelines. It talks about governance, risk management, and internal controls. And then it has some brief guidance on third-party AI systems and data. Recall that more than 50% of the AI that's being used is being provided for third-party systems. So our regulators wanted to express some nuance related to that aspect of this, really emphasizing that companies retain the responsibility. They also understand that the due diligence to launch AI developed by third parties looks different. It just is. When you are deploying your own AI models, you own the data. And so the way that the regulator is going to ask questions is going to be different than the way that they would ask questions if it was a Microsoft model, for instance. Then the last part of the bulletin explains the examination-related concepts. It really just says all the exam concepts that apply before, we believe we will tailor for this situation, and we will ask you similar questions to that. So what comes next? I'll just close out and say our regulators are in the process of having many, 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 many discussions to continue to update our regulatory framework. So they are going to have discussions to evaluate the use of AI. So how are they going to do exams or market conduct analysis? They're having specific discussions to talk about, well, how do we regulate the third-party use in this space? Do we need to license them? Do we need to subject them to any sort of model review? That's a fairly open-ended discussion. I expect that will take at least two more years. But that's one of the ongoing discussions that's happening right now at the NAC. And then the last of it, if you recognize a lot of the background of our regulators, they're used to performing examinations, inspections, evaluations, but perhaps not in the context of AI. So we recognize that, and our departments recognize that they may need to hire additional or different staff. But in the meantime, we still have a lot of staff that are highly skilled and want to make sure that they prepare them to ask the right questions. So this year, we're going to provide some additional training to the regulators, and then we're going to listen, hear some feedback from the regulators, and then deploy more training next year. And so, you know, I think what the story is, is that our regulators recognize this is an important moment. And make no mistake, our regulators want the insurance industry to benefit from the use of AI, potential bonus in the technology. But they also want people to engage and use AI in a responsible manner. And so they're just trying to make sure that our regulatory framework is ready to ask the questions that are necessary to ensure that consumers are being protected. That does bring me to the close of my presentation. I'm happy to address any questions if there are any. Otherwise, thank you very much for this opportunity to present to this group. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Thank you, Mr. Lee.
Miguel, do you mind if I jump in with one real quick? Kind of coming from, I guess I'm ignorant some from the, uh, from the insurance side of things. Um, so when we talk about you know, ethical application of AI, a lot of times we have to talk about model validation um, and making sure that the actual model itself is doing what we expect it to do. Um, we have this idea of black box models in ML where we don't know what's going on because they're so gosh darn complicated. Think uh, neural networks and LLMs. Um, and you can actually build these models. Uh, my favorite one to point to, it's a little bit old now, like 2018, um, called Laundry ML, which makes an explanation for anything that a neural network would give you, but is able to twist it into an acceptable approach or a, an acceptable reason, right? Uh, what, what type of steps can, can you kind of do for these like black box models that we can easily be fooled with uh, and kind of explain away that their, that their reasoning is fine, but how do, how do we validate in that kind of black box, fuzzy, unknown land of these, of these complicated models? It's so funny, I, I, I'm just, I, was, I was thinking about the fact that you said, you know, it's kind of an older model back in 2018. <laughs> and I thought that's how fast this space is moving, right? Yeah, that's, no, yeah. Uh, that's how uh, quick it is developing. Um, I, I think ultimately what our regulators have, have tentatively concluded is, is that responsibility to prove that lies with the companies. And so if that means that the company has to wrestle with the lack of transparency for a given model, compared to maybe an AI technique that's more transparent, but maybe less potent, ultimately we put that decision back on, on the company to say, why is it appropriate to use that model in this situation? Because there may be some situations where, say the black box has less of a material impact and you can just look at the outcomes that, uh, that result, right? You, you don't have to understand how the machine got to it as long as you're comfortable with the outcomes in certain circumstances. Um, so, so the regulators really put that onus back on companies. Now, what I tell you is, that I talk to data scientists and actuaries, and tell you that even with those those, those black box block models, there are techniques you can use to peek behind and, and try to understand the relative priority of, of specific assumptions, or or it even look in at like the methodology that you undertook to develop the model. You can still you can still kick the tires, so to speak, in in, in certain cases. It just is. Time uh, intensive and requires certain disciplines and expertise to really be done properly. Like I, I wouldn't be able to do that to a model. You have to hire someone with, with uh, far more uh, data science and expertise. So, so really, I think that's the way that our, our regulators are approaching this: is, is to say, look, ultimately, if you will, if you are the one that is deploying a model, then ultimately, what you're saying is that this is fit for use. Now, that's the dynamic right now. I do think in the future, the regulators have to decide: are there certain models that we maybe are going to be less comfortable with? Um, and, and therefore, does that mean anything for the way that we require or prohibit uh, anything for the insurance industry? That's a long discussion, and frankly, a big discussion that could go any number of different ways, but that is a question that we will have to wrestle with, and not one that they have an answer for right now. But generally, it's, it's ultimately, if you're deploying the model, it's your responsibility. Yes. Sometimes it might be, uh, but that's case-by-case -case basis. Any questions from the audience? More of a note for you. Human impact, human input, that's very large in your models. The, the people in this room are based on experience, where they've lived, where they went to college, how they grew up. Today I'm seeing more social media raising you don't have that actual hands-on, out in the field, boots on the ground experience. And as, as we go forward, I see that becoming more and more computer generated is what I'm gonna call it, social media. How do you see that affecting the models in, into the future when sometimes that hands-on, boots on the ground input could change how that model reads. So to, to a great question, thank you very much for that. You know, what I tell you is that the first wave of innovation that we saw in the insurance industry came with a lot of people that just discarded all the experience the insurance industry already had, and they said, well, you know, we don't need to do this thing called underwriting. We're just gonna stop it because it's inefficient. 
And then it turns out, well, if you don't ask them the right questions, you don't really understand the risk that you are uh, protecting, that you're, you're offering coverage on. And, and so many of the first insure tech companies that jumped into this space were unsuccessful over a quick period of time. This, this last wave of so-called disruptors have been a little bit more collaborative to recognize like, okay, we made a mistake. We shouldn't have tossed out all the experience and expertise that people brought to the table. Let's instead work together. And, and so what I think and what I hope will be the model that, that goes forward is one that does work together, that recognizes you have experience and expertise that is important. It is vital for us to factor in when we are developing and deploying the use of AI. And it, there may be nuances that you can offer that may say, hey, even if this is a pattern that you would observe, that is correlation, not causation. Here's, here's what I know that the model won't necessarily tell you. So I, I think the best deployment of models has been a collaborative one from understanding of working with the regulators, from my understanding of working with industry, from my understanding of working with tech companies. This is not just a problem or a tool that data scientists on their own can launch. Really the best teams include people within the field experience, include people across the disciplines, across backgrounds. So I think what you'll find is that, is that really uh, the most successful people are the ones that approach uh, business in the way that you're talking about. And, and so that's that to me is what resonates the most, working together instead of replacing. Um, I'm sure there will be people that try to still throw out all the insights that the, that our, our many uh, experienced underwriters and claims agents have. But I think, think that will prove over time to be short-sighted and, and limited in benefit, and you'll see that come through in the bottom line, in the relationship with customers, in the service that's being provided. And so I, I hope that the market helps to play a role in that, and certainly responsible companies and in, uh, uh, regulators will play a role in that as well. But but that's 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 kind of my view and, and my understanding of, of, of what I'm hearing is that is that some of that yes was happening, it's happening less, and to the extent it still is happening that people aren't listening, let's say. Um, I'm hoping that over time people recognize it, it just life's better if you work together. And I think that's gonna happen just the same for AI, right? Like ultimately it's a tool and we have to recognize that it is a tool it is not a cure for all that ails the insurance industry, all that ails the insurance industry at times, right? It's not a magic pill that's gonna turn you from unprofitable to profitable, to get from one to the other, to become more successful, to improve your bottom line, to improve your service. It's really gonna require a collaborative spirit. And I think if you approach it with that, I think over time companies will find themselves to that better outcome. That may be a little naive, but that's the optimistic view that I have so far based on my uh, networking with people. But thank you for that question. And I'll, I'll just add two points real quick too, because talking from more of the academic side, when we build the models themselves, we have two ideas that speak exactly to that. The first one's called model collapse, where a model trains off of its own output, and this is very much like an echo chamber, or people you know, will put something on social me media, hear it back, and then we'll change their views on that. And that's one thing that we're very afraid of with these models, and why a lot of models are kind of frozen at the 2021 uh, data sets, right? The information we got from 2021 before LLMs were really popular. Um, and the other one is this idea of a grounding problem where we might say a model is intelligent, but ultimately it doesn't understand what's happening because it's not grounded in the real world. It's missing that experience, right? And these are both at the frontiers of AI and ML research and ones that anytime anyone talks, at least in my lab, talks to us, we make sure to bring them up, right? That these are things to be wary of and to consider and to think about how you can solve these problems. There's a more of a comment uh, than anything else like that. There's a little thing called da data integrity when we kind of look at things when it comes to either AI or computer programming. Uh, we need to verify that the data that is actually being produced actually has some validity to it and there has to be some checks and balances. Um, what I'm hearing is, is that the regulations are coming out, but it feels like that the, the current unmature information is being used faster than what the regulations can actually come in and apply. And the reason why I say that is because we're already seeing policies being removed or being discontinued or being non-renewed based on, from what I've heard today and from what I'm hearing, 
is still developing data when it comes. Very important developing data, very awesome and developing data. But we're seeing policies being affected, which ultimately is our customers and which is our actual people out there are being affected by unmature data. Sorry, was that for me? So the question was about uh, the challenge of immature data and, and, and how to deal with it, right? Correct. So, so I mean, ultimately, it, 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 we still have the same issue of before. AI is more powerful. It can help us uh, extend our insights, extend our capabilities. But if you don't have good data to begin with, like it's going to be a challenge. And I'm dealing with that in several different circumstances. So for you to be successful to start with, you, you really do have to have that, that proper data source to begin with. Now, having said that, I think, again, if you bring in a, a broad team, you may find that you actually have more data that available to you than, than is necessary, either from stat gens, probably available sources, um, from you know a couple different resources. Now, I, I, that can't solve the problem for every, everyone, but I think it's just, it's, an in, it's not a, a problem that can be uh, sidestep, you really do have to wrestle with uh, taking the time to make sure that you have the right foundation because that's what the data is going to give you. The right foundation to make sure that the problem you're solving is really being given the right uh, data from the beginning. So bear in mind, like sometimes in what you feed it, you're, you're making a decision that may sound insignificant, but it could prove to be significant. So if you're feeding it only people that have committed, say, uh, uh, if, you're, if you're looking for broad and you only feed it a subset of the, the, of the population, you may actually teach it to look for broad only in narrow circumstances. And so it really takes a lot of time to think about what is not in our data set that should be. So data, data maturity is, is just an, impo is a, is an important challenge. I, I can't necessarily solve that for people, but I would just say bring in a diverse team, really try to think outside the box, but recognize that is an important part of the process that can't be sidestepped. Hope that answers your question. We got one more question over here. Sure, somewhat already answered, but well, very accomplished for a student at MSU, go Cats. Um, make me feel old. I actually left the AI research area in 2018, so now everything has changed. I'll ask you the same question that you kind of asked Miguel with explainable AI, that was such a huge hard topic, and you were talking about models, you know, using millions of data points and then sometimes collapsing it to an end user to a one to five score. Is there more advances happening there in the research area to be able to bridge that millions of data points that the computer is seeing down to more explainable Here's why. We talked a lot about fires earlier today, so it could be in that domain. Yes, but there's still a lot of work to be done too, right? Um, with what, what people tend to prefer to go for right off the bat is just train a model and show that the model has good accuracy or has good performance, right? Um, and then we have to take a step back and validate and ask why does it have good performance, right? Um, and what we see a lot of times when we try to do those is that either what these ex uh, explainability uh, models show us is that it seems to almost be gibberish, that these models seem to be picking up, right? That's one direction. Um, so you train a model, you use what's called an explainability model on top of that to extract out why a model seemed to be working, right? Uh, and you might get back like a nugget or two of really cool information, right? These are the features, these are the characteristics that were most important, right? And it might look like, you know, uh, why did a fire spread this fast in this area? And then it comes back and say, oh, it's because the elevation and the, uh, the fuel packing that existed, or and then it might also flag something like it was because of the color of the uh, tree canopy, even though it was just on the ground, right? Um, and then you have to look at that and understand from that explainability model that told me these are the features that were most important, that you know those first two make a lot of sense. But why the heck does the color of the canopy matter, right? And it might be because of something justified, right? Maybe it shows the health of the tree. Maybe it shows, you know, something more integral to actually uh, to the actual model. 
or it might be picking up what we call uh, shortcutting or hitchhiking of information where it's learned how to leverage something that's not important. Uh, if, I take, if I show you pictures of cats and dogs, I might be showing you all a picture of cats indoors and dogs outside. And so if I show you a picture of a cat outside, it's going to recognize the outside and say it's a dog, right? Because it's, it's grabbed onto the wrong part of the problem and learned the wrong part of the problem, right? And what these explainability models can show us is, does it seem to be kind of highlighting the wrong part of it? The other direction, and this is the direction I prefer to go, is not explainability, but interpretability. Can I interpret what the model is doing? And this is where the idea of black box and white box models come in, right? A black box model is too big, too complicated, too difficult to understand, or you know, you can spend far too long trying to pull it apart and understand all the stuff, or try to over project what an explainability model gives you. The other direction, and this is the reason general linear, linear models are so powerful and so important, is because they're easy to just understand like that. We've probably have seen things like decision trees, right? Where you know you start at a head node and they make a decision, and then you make a decision, and you end up getting to an end conclusion. Those are interpretable. We understand how these different steps are happening, and we can kind of think through them, right? Um, and so you can either interpret it from first principles, or you can try to explain it afterwards. Um, there's more and more explanation models that come out every day. There's more and more, well, not as many interpretable models that come out every day, but the power seems to kind of lie where you need explainability, which is very annoying and requires a lot of understanding and, and what the heck is happening. Yeah, does that kind of help? Yeah. That that's great. My question for Miguel really is kind of piggybacking on the data question, so it was partially already answered, but we are used to, I think, the data points that insurance maybe normally looked at, whether it's health insurance or whatever, but now there's so much more data in the universe with social media and potentially even spoof data with social media and all that, especially when we're looking at third-party systems bringing in parts of the solution, it seems very difficult to understand what all data is truly being used. And I just think that's a, a huge challenge, probably a big part for the regulation, but if you have any further comments on that, I think you also did talk to it a little bit already, so that's fine. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it, the third parties are just, they present such a value, such an important value proposition because they often do not access to additional data that can be meaningful. It's just, the challenge is, well, that you might not have that data because that may, they may be considered that naive, or um, just the willingness to share statistics on that may be limited or maybe they un unwilling. And so I, I think it's just a challenge of still taking the time to make sure you're engaged and that you're engaging in the right due diligence, but also that you understand what's the outcome that's going to happen, and is there a way to mitigate any risk that might be present on the back end? So they're not necessarily just a, a one solution. It's important. So we definitely, like I said, regulators want industry to benefit from this important uh, threshold in platform where we're at, but I want them to be as good as possible. So I think I don't know if there's a single answer to offer aside from the right time. That is, that is a challenge. Great. Big, big thank you and a big hand to Will and, and Miguel. Um.